I want to pop in with a quick timely update that my 12-week curriculum called Smart Body, Smart Mind, some people know this as SBSM, we will be running it again in September 2023. To be exact, we will open up registration on September 12th for one week and we will begin around the 24th of September, a fresh new round. This will be the 14th time we have run this powerful online curriculum. That's all I'm gonna say about it now. I just wanna make sure you know, just in case you're wondering how you can do this work with me, how you can put the, the education and the theory into practice. Of course, Smart Body, Smart Mind is also education, but a lot of practice and people have been doing this curriculum for many years now. We've had people from all over the country go through this curriculum and have much success. Check it out, get on the wait list and mark your calendars for September 12th, which is when we open up registration. Hey there, everyone, it's Irene Lyon here. I am coming to you live on this Thursday, the 18th of February, 2021. Um, just here for my monthly special topic lecture. And today I'm going to be talking about all things polyvagal theory. And I'm going to get into what it is. I'm going to talk about the maybe sort of the misunderstood pieces around it. I'll take your questions. Um, this is something that I have talked about in many of my other videos. I've done another video called Polyvagal Explained. So this will be a bit of a review of that. Um, and my other videos that are out there that talk about healthy human development and the freeze response and the immobility response and how we shut down under times of stress. Every single part of those pieces of education, it is talking about what this polyvagal theory theorizes about how the human system works, how we have adaptive responses based on the environment around us, but also very dependent on how we were raised in the first three years of our life will determine how we respond, adapt or don't adapt to the situations around us. So um, I'm just gonna do a little bit of housekeeping here to make sure I have everything I need um, and just looking at the chat here, that's working well. So I'm going to show you a book. This is the polyvagal theory by Stephen Porges. And the title is neurophysiological foundations of emotions, attachment, communication, and self-regulation. Now this book, I don't recommend unless you want to read what is kind of like a research paper in a huge text form. All the work in here is Stephen's work as well as the literature review and the, the work that he has clearly studied deeply um, through his studies, learning about the vagus nerve, kind of his passion, his love. Um, and this book was see when this was written 2011 so this is really new right um and even some of my teachers would say that it's unnecessarily complex um i won't tell you who said that but it's unnecessarily complex but it has everything in it so it's really his magnum opus of his research thus far right because research science it's not um a point in time that ends, it's always evolving. Um, but I'm gonna speak about the parts of this theory um, that are important. Now, the other book, if you wanna get a little deeper into this on your own, this is a book by one of my teachers, Nurturing Resilience by Kathy Kane and Steve Terrell. Um, and this is more geared towards practitioners, but someone who's just really interested in health can easily read through this. It's not that complex and they break down the most essential pieces. So nurturing resilience, helping clients move forward from developmental trauma. So when we talk about the polyvagal theory and the vagus nerve, we have to, or I am looking at it from an early trauma point of view and also how we heal as adults now that we want to take on that challenge 
that learning and heal the early traumas that essentially set us off into motion towards sickness, unwellness, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so this is a little easier to uh, stomach and to read. You won't need a science dictionary to get through it. Um, I will read a portion when we get to a certain part. Um, but Kathy and Steve have a real nice outline in that book on the polyvagal theory. Essentially, that is the textbook to their courses. Um, I have been trained by them um, over quite a few years. And um, while you can buy that, anyone can buy that, that kind of gives you an overview of the theory. It is not practical, right? So this work that we do, that I do, it really can't be taught in a book. Um, and that's because it's complex, it's intricate, and everyone is a little different. All right, so as it stands, or as it, as it sounds, I should say, polyvagal, poly basically means many, vagal means the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve is one of our cranial nerves, comes out of the skull, and then it feeds cranial nerves go to different parts of the body. We have nerves that, nerves that go to the face, nerves that go to the eyes. Um, and then of course we have this vagus nerve. So I'm not gonna go through all the cranial nerves, but there are many of them. Um, the vagus nerve travels to two spots and the vagus nerve is part of the parasympathetic nervous system. So quick lesson, our nervous system, so when I say nervous system, I am meaning autonomic nervous system. And so we have something called the central nervous system, which is the brain and spinal cord. Then we have the peripheral nervous system. So if you can imagine, I've got these little graphs here. Um, we have the peripheral nervous system and the peripheral means just that, right? So even right now, if you think of your periphery, actually go ahead and do this, like humor me here. I can't see you. So try this. When you think of the peripheral area around you, it's to the left, to the right. If you turn, it's to the left, to the right. So the periphery, the peripheral nervous system is everything not center, not central, right? Pretty simple. And the peripheral nervous system has a few different nervous systems, one of which is the autonomic nervous system. And the autonomic nervous system is governed or has two branches as well, two sets of nervous systems. One is the sympathetic nervous system. We also will call it the SNS, the sympathetic nervous system. The other is the parasympathetic nervous system. You following me here? This is where notes are good. If you're taking notes, that's always a good thing. So we have these two nervous systems, central, peripheral, the peripheral, periphery, the nerves that come out of the spine, right? The nerves that come out of the brain and then feed to different areas. The vagus nerve is one of these peripheral nervous system nerves, and it has two branches as well. And then you're going to learn that there's another two branches. So I'm going to talk about the anatomy just briefly, and then we'll get into the functions. So parasympathetic nervous system. Often people think of this as the rest digest. This is starting to finally be kind of nuanced in popular press, but I still have yet to see that happen. And this is where accuracy and discernment around specific parts of the system are very important when we are looking to heal a dysregulated autonomic, that peripheral nervous system. Hopefully you're following me here. So the parasympathetic nervous system has two branches. And this is where we start to dive into polyvagal theory. Remember how I said it's often is said the parasympathetic nervous system is just rest, digest, and the sympathetic nervous system, I forgot to mention that, is that fight, flight. It's that activation. It gets the blood going, right? So if I was to all of a sudden say to you guys, okay, no more lecture, we're gonna do some jumping jacks and do some exercise, your heart rate, your blood pressure, we hope will increase so that you can get the muscles, blood, oxygen to the muscles, and also excrete the waste products of cell metabolism and exercise metabolism. So the sympathetic nervous system is that get up and go. It's also survival. It's the fight and the flee. 
Um, it's that I need to protect myself and get out of this tricky, sticky situation. I need to protect my children, whatever it might be. Parasympathetic is the vagus nerve. It is the vagus nerve. And so when we think of polyvagal theory, often what is thought of is it's all vagus nerve. And that's a half truth. The polyvagal theory is, is essentially expressing a theory a in, in how we see it and I see it a reality that there is a cascade of actions, reactions, however you want to call it, within our autonomic nervous system that responds to the current state in which we are in. And I'll say that a different way. The polyvagal theory basically theorizes and understands that the human being, our autonomic nervous system, not just the vagus nerve, but the autonomic nervous system has a job to shift through almost like a gearbox in a car. You know, if you drive a stick shift, it shifts through these gears of our autonomic nervous system physiological responses to protect ourselves, to connect with others, to soothe ourselves, to soothe others, to be social, to shut down, to fight, to flight. Did that the wrong way, fight, flight, right? So it's not just the vagus nerve. It is the entire way in which our nervous system, our autonomic nervous system, I'll be very clear there, orchestrates life. Quite simple. So um, simple and not, right? It's complex. And so the old way, and I have two branches that I'll talk about with the parasympathetic. The old way that used to talk about parasympathetic, sympathetic was um, kind of this reciprocal interaction where if I get stressed or if I have to do something that's taxing and puts my fight flight up, there will be this automatic kick in of the parasympathetic to calm the system down. And we know now that that is not accurate. We are more complex than that, right? Because sometimes we might go into a stress response and we stay there, right? Or sometimes we go into a stress response and we know how to bring ourselves down with varying things that aren't necessarily just going into rest, digest. So that old view is kind of old. And this new view, at least from my experience, my colleagues' experiences, my teachers' experiences, and my students' experiences, this new view of this polyvagal interaction with ourselves and the environment, we are seeing is more accurate. It's more true to the, um, the nuance and the complexity of the human system, the mammalian system. So I'm just going to go into the chat box here and make sure we're all doing good. I'm going to have a little sip. Hello from the Czech Republic. Hello from Wisconsin, Europe, Texas, Germany, Romania, Toronto. All right. Okay. So wanted to have a pause there because I just gave that bit of science. So if we think now of the parasympathetic nervous system, that vagus nerve, it goes to two spots. And I'm being very general. One spot is to the everything below the diaphragm. So if you want to play along, um, put your hands underneath your chest and just say hello to your belly. Say hello to the liver, the spleen, the pancreas, the gallbladder, the intestines, the stomach. Say hello to the reproductive organs, the kidneys, the bladder, the appendix. All the stuff below the diaphragm is where one portion of the vagus nerve goes, one branch. Everything above the diaphragm, including the throat, the pharynx, the larynx, the ear, and innervations, connections with the face muscles. It doesn't go to the face muscles, but it connects with the nerve that innervates the face muscles. The other portion of this vagus nerve goes above the diaphragm, also to the heart. So again, you can 
guide yourself through here to feel these things, these parts of your body to go, oh, and it is there. I can guarantee you if you were alive watching this, you have a vagus nerve that is going, part of your vagus nerve is going to this bottom below the diaphragm. The other part is what we would call super diaphragmatic above the diaphragm, heart, the vo voice box, throat box, and then ear and this higher part. Now, someone said, um, how does the vagus nerve fit into the autonomic nervous system? It is part of the autonomic nervous system. It is part. So remember I had mentioned autonomic nervous system is part of that peripheral nervous system. And then the autonomic nervous system has two branches, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. So now take the parasympathetic in front of us. Imagine it. it is the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve is one of the um, most intricate nerves in our body. It's not, it's, it's not necessarily the longest, but is the most intricate. It, it's Vegas means it's wandering. It wanders all over the body. The part that's low that goes to the gut is classified is termed the dorsal, dorsal branch of the vagus nerve. Dorsal means back, and it's because it travels out of our brain area from the back, keeping it really simple here. The front, the front that goes to above the diaphragm, the throat and parts of the inner ear and connects to the facial muscles or corresponds and interacts with some of our facial nerves, I should say, is called the ventral vagal, the ventral portion of the vagus nerve. Again, these are things that I have mentioned in other videos. I'm breaking it down today with a few more examples. So the ventral vagal is above, the dorsal vagal is below. Now, these two branches are what give us more um, nuance and differentiation as a, as a human that is a mammal. So other mammals have this. So now I'm gonna give you a real simple example to take the science and kind of put it to the side and make it more real life. If you think about our pets, right? Dogs, cats, um, animals that are classified as mammal, mammalian, they have this, they have both the dorsal and the ventral aspect of this vagus parasympathetic nervous system. That is why um, you can tilt your head to an animal and connect with them and of course, depending on the demeanor of the animal and how they were treated, um, they will look at you and they will smile. You know, golden retrievers are very much like that. I can't remember the, the animated show where the golden retriever was just the friendliest thing ever and you could do anything to it, right? And it was always happy, right? And so that, that connection to tilt the head, smile, or if I start to um, do something that is less, animated and more, we would call cold and less based in good talking sound. And I become a robot. This is acting everyone. It's hard to do it, but I become very stone cold, very, right? Very stoic. You might start to feel that and it won't necessarily feel great. So let's break out of that. So having this, we call it prosody, being able to inflect and go down and be very calm or very stern, boundary, no, or come here, I'll help you. This is part of our social engagement as mammals, right? If a dog is hurt, I'll use the dog example, and has been harmed, one would hope you're gonna go up to it with a very calm, gentle voice. You're not gonna do abrupt movements, right? Same, I hope we would do with a child and just a human who's in need. We are gonna change our prosody and our, our quality of empathy, our pressure in our body so that the other mammal, the other person feels of greater safety. Might you guys following me here? So. Part of this vagus nerve, the ventral portion that goes to the heart, this area in the throat, the face connects with the facial muscles, 
it allows us to have that social engagement. And the social engagement part is really one of the pivotal parts of this polyvagal piece because when we are wired, when we are little we infants, we don't have this social engagement portion of the vagus nerve fully online. So the part of this nerve that goes to the this, this higher area, I'll just say this area, very technical, this ventral portion of the vagus nerve, it is not myelinated when we are born. So nerves, some nerves have something called myelination around them. And it makes it so that they can conduct messages and movement through the body in a much more refined and discerning way, myelination. The dorsal, the down here vagus nerve, it is not myelinated. It is what we would call more primitive. So when a baby is born, and I always have to go back to the baby example because it's one of the better examples. When a baby is born, healthy, I'm going to say healthy, full term, lungs are working, digestion is working, their dorsal elements are online, right? They can poop, they can pee, their immune system isn't quite there yet, but that's a, a more complex system. But this, this working area of their gut is doing its job. Little baby can suckle, can eat, digest food, peeps, poos it out, pees out the liquid, it works. But what that little infant doesn't have is this social engagement. It starts to spark in little stars as they are held, as they are looked at, as they see the face of the mother or the nanny or the big brother or heck, even the family pet that comes in and looks at them, right? So seeing the face and feeling that oozing goodness connection and the calm voice and the gentle voice starts to perk up and it starts to myelinate that little human's ventral vagal nerve. Now, the reason why that is important, the reason why that is important is this ventral vagal aspect is also, remember how I said it goes to the heart? It helps calm the heart. So it can help calm the heart. That is why I mentioned if um, we have a passerby in the street and they're in distress and they are going into their fight flight and they, or maybe they're shut down already because they've broken a bone and they have to preserve. And I'll get into that in a little bit. If we come up to them and if we're calm and safe and slow like this, like this, and we're regulated, that feeds to their vagus, to their heart, and it helps them self-regulate. So there's a co-regulation happening between our parasympathetic ventral vagal portions of the nervous system, of the parasympathetic nervous system. All right, I'm going to pause for a second because I want to keep going. I know this is, for some of you, this might be old review. For others, this might be brand new. Someone says, is stuttering when nervous connected with the vagus nerve? It's connected to unsafety. But yes, yes. So, so again, <clears throat> this is a great question. The vagus nerve is the parasympathetic nervous system, right? And so this is why I love doing this. And this is also why sometimes I don't want you to get so obsessed with just working on the vagus nerve that you forget all the other pieces because the vagus nerve is the parasympathetic nervous system. If that parasympathetic nervous system didn't get the right safety, remember how I just mentioned the little baby when they're born, they need that soft, oozy, good connection from a regulated caregiver, consistency, nurturing, unconditional love, that builds that, that vagus nerve, the ventral portion, it myelinates it. So it is like a rock star nerve, right? It really helps it do its job. Stuttering, there's a great movie. Uh, it's the King's Speech. Great movie. Um, 
I forget the actor, <laughs> um, but he has, they call it stammering. And in that movie, they look at the trauma within that household. I mean, it was just, it's so common, that kind of trauma. And so that ability to, to vocalize smoothly is, and I am not an expert in stuttering, but there is something happening in the peripheral nervous system. Because remember I said the peripheral nervous system goes out. The peripheral nervous system is also what, like I've got my cup of tea here. I have my glass of water here. I can tell there are different heavinesses. I can feel this is cold. This is hot. So, and I can put this down softly. I don't just drop it. That fine tuning of me putting it down is also part of my peripheral nervous system. It's the motor sensory aspects that, that I don't have to think. My brain just knows, pick up the glass of water to show these 129 people and don't drop it because you guys will hear a big bang. So I do it slowly and gently. There's feedback constantly going through to my muscles, to my nervous system to do that. We're so complex, right? And so if we think of speaking, if we think of the air passages here, the airways, the muscles of the face, the ability to vocalize, were we able to vocalize when we were young with someone there to talk to us? All this will interplay and interact with how we grow and develop as little ones, how we are able to express ourselves, right? So um, just looking at the comments here. Okay. So I see a few things on fainting. So we'll keep going, you guys. So keep, keep listening. So that was, a, you know, we could say the stuttering is more than just the vagus nerve. It's the whole system interacting with the environment, et cetera. And I'm going to read something from Kathy and Steve's book here because it goes into what I just talked about. Okay. This comes back to the myelination piece about the ventral vagal. So myelination begins in the third trimester of pregnancy. So still when we're in utero and continues through adolescence, continues through adolescence, right? We're continually growing as we are teens, but the most rapid phase of myelination takes place during the first six months after birth. So that's a quote from Porges's work. This means that during the first few months of life, and to a certain degree, the first few years of life, we are dependent on our caregivers for many, for many of the more nuanced functions of the ventral vagal system. Some of the methods for soothing via caregivers are built into norm normal parent-child behaviors. For example, the muscles for suckling, right? When we suck and masticate, so chew, are wired via the vagus system to downregulate our heart when they are in use, which is partly why the infant will seek out soothing activity of suckling, right, and skin to skin contact to calm himself. Later in life, we may share meals and hugs with friends and family as a way of building and reinforcing the same soothing social connections. So these are things that we hopefully learn when we're young. What we know, however, is that with dysregulation in the household, if mom doesn't have this soothing, welcoming, hello, how are you? You're amazing. Let's, let's feed you when you're hungry. Let's not feed you when you're not hungry. Let's keep you warm. Let's keep you by me. Let's rock you. Let's see the world. Let's interact with you. When that doesn't occur, that early wiring, that primary wiring isn't getting done as well as it could. And this, my friends, is what connects to some of the research that is very, very um I, I know most people don't want to say conclusive, but they've done it so much around the world that to me it's conclusive. The Adverse Childhood Experiences study, it shows that when there is early adversity, early stress, 
early unsafety, things aren't safe, and that infant is not getting that good myelination of the ventral vagus nerve, um, their likelihood of having a chronic illness, a mental illness, um, certain types of cancer, heart disease, addiction, autoimmune conditions, chronic pain, the long list of chronic conditions that so many humans are plagued with, it makes that more probable because this early wiring wasn't there that helps to downregulate the heart and soothe and create self-regulation. Now, someone mentioned a question about fainting. I'll get into that because to understand the chronic illness piece of things, we have to understand the other part of the vagus nerve, which is that dorsal part, the part that goes to the gut, the part that we would say is more primitive, okay? So I'm gonna pause, I'm gonna look at the questions. Um, yes, yeah, so someone just said, we're getting there. Can ulcerative colitis be caused by a burnt out nervous system? 100%. The question about babies, premature babies and myelination, you'd have to look. Um, I have no doubt um, that depending on why that kiddo was premature and the stress that maybe was caused within, um, within utero, um, yes, it, it might influence myelination. These are things that are so individual. It's so hard to study this at the human level because how the human mother responds during pregnancy is dependent on so many factors. It isn't just what she's eating, for example, which is a big part. It's who is she around? Has she worked with her own traumatic stresses? Is she in a state of dysregulation while she's carrying, right? This is so common, but it's not something we often think about. That will influence how well and how um, robust and resilient that infant, that infant internally grows. Okay, so gonna go to the dorsal. So I mentioned Again, remember parasympathetic nervous system is the vagus nerve, part of the autonomic nervous system. One portion of the vagus nerve goes to the gut. It goes below the diaphragm. Now, the other thing about the polyvagal theory is that it, and I'm gonna use a big word here, but it, it assumes what we would call a phylogenetic um, reality. And what that means is that we respond we respond to stress based on kind of a hierarchy of um, how well mature we are as a mammal and within the animal spectrum. So I'll give you an example. Us as mammals, we have the, us as human mammals, we have the ability to socially engage, right? I'll use again that example, passerby on the street, um, isn't well, we can engage with them. We can also tell if it's safe or not, hopefully, right? And this again is where if our nervous system is a little off, we actually can find ourselves situations where we think it's safe, but we don't read the situation properly. And we dive into an unsafe situation because our, our what we call, and Porges calls it, our neuroception is off. Our perception of danger or safety is off. But let's just say, Again, this is just an example. We see someone who is uh, hurt and we as a, a good, you know, Samaritan go to help them. The mo Let's just say, again, we go and then we realize they're actually about to become violent towards us, right? Maybe um, we found someone who is God only knows what. They're not in a good space and they start to attack us, maybe verbally. If we have... A nervous system that has all these branches, which we do, we will phylogenetically go through our human mammalian options to help ease the situation. The first being social engagement. So humans tend to go with the more advanced, the more sophisticated option, which is to engage. Hey, hey, you know, it's okay. Like, I'm not here to hurt you. You know, let's just, let's, let's stay calm. It's okay. Can I get you some help? What is your name? Where do you live? Um, you know, I'm just here to help. I really am. And that, that very empathetic social engagement, 
And let's just say that works. And then that soothes and just de-escalates the situation. And then the other person feels it in their system and you co-regulate, that helps them self-regulate, it helps you self-regulate. But let's just say the person becomes more belligerent and you start to feel a little danger. You may then start to, I gotta get out of here. Or maybe you have a, a, a guard coming up that's like, okay, I better, like, where's my, where are my keys if I want a weapon or, or where, you know, who's around me? We become oriented defensively to try to protect. And so let's just say that that situation doesn't escalate. Then we might start to run, right? We're like, I gotta get, it, get out of here. I gotta get out of here. I've gotta run. So that fight flight comes in. Let's just say, again, terrible example, but this is what happens. Let's just say the fight flight doesn't work and they attack us and we are shit out of luck, right? We're like, I can't get out of this. The system then will go into a freeze immobility state. So there's this primitive action that comes at the end. This is what this phylogenetic cascade of action reaction is based on threat. Okay, so I wanted to just spell that out because how we as human beings in the world respond to stress, well, that's a more specific danger, shock, trauma kind of thing. Um, let's just say um, our children come home from school and they're really stressed or something is happening, we would hope you know, as mature regulated people, even if we're trying to learn to be regulated, we're gonna be like, hey, what's going on? But many of us, maybe we had upbringings where we came home when we were little from school and we were having a bad day and our caregivers weren't nervous system mature, they weren't regulated and they snapped at us, they went into defensive mode or they ignored us, right? They didn't, they didn't attune to our upset or maybe to our exuberance and happiness. So this social engagement is very important, but getting now to the dorsal, to the dorsal side, um, it is what we go into when we, um, I'm gonna start that again. So the dorsal aspect of the parasympathetic used to be just known, or I should say the parasympathetic rest digest was often what we thought of the parasympathetic. This dorsal branch, part of it is that, Part of it is that we would call it the low tone dorsal. So if we're chilling at night, watching a show, reading a book, sleeping, resting, dozing, just chilling by the beach, real calm, there's no threat, we're in really good safety, that puts us into this low tone dorsal of the parasympathetic, which recoups and repairs our body. It repairs our cells, it enhances our immune system, it repairs the lining of the gut. Someone mentioned ulcerative colitis. Someone also mentioned autoimmune disease, I think, or autoimmunity, I should say. Um, I, don't, I don't like actually saying autoimmune disease because to me, autoimmune issues are a response to the nervous system being dysregulated as a result of traumatic stress overload in the system. And so we're chill, right? So we're, we're in this, yummy, good healing space. That would be one portion of the dorsal tone of the vagus nerve. The other portion, we call it the high tone. It's more of the alert, alert, something really bad is happening. I better preserve and protect and shut down. This is the freeze. This is the shutdown. This is the system preparing for death. There is a mobilization of blood to the core organs leaves the uh, extremities, our metabolism slows down, our oxygen consumption goes down. It's like we're going into a hibernation. The system is literally um, preserving metabolism because it senses, um, you know, we might not get food, we might need to protect, and I need to kind of be really small and, and just slow. So this is that dorsal. It puts us into this hibernation mode and protects us. Animals that hibernate, they fully use this, but not from, a, not from a dysregulated state. It's just where they go into, right? So this is where we are different from mammals like bears, etc. Now, the one thing, now, 
some people will say, you'll look up, if you, how can I calm my vagus nerve, right, on the internet? One of the key things that often people say is splash the face with cold water. Has anybody heard that? Or what is really popular right now, going into ice baths. And I am not a big um, advocate for that when it's done prolonged to the point where a person is numbing out and they're not feeling their body. I am, I love hydrotherapy for other reasons. And that's another topic in itself for circulation and, and just getting the lymph going. But when we overuse cold water, but if we, if we overuse cold water, our system starts to think we're going into death and it will start to slow the metabolism down. Everything will go to the, to the core because it's trying to preserve and stay warm. Um, and it's a bit of a stress response. It's a dorsal activated response. But the splashing of the water on the face um, happens because of something called the dive reflex. So the big, big fishes in the ocean, right? I'm not good on my biology with that, but the big animals in the ocean that dive underwater and can stay underwater for a long period of time, their nervous system is very primitive and they, they need the dorsal, this high tone dorsal to preserve oxygen when they're diving into the ocean looking for food and doing their thing down there. And so they, they function well, that is what they need so that they slow their metabolism down. Of course, they don't have limbs like we do. They are not human, they're not on land. And so they can survive with a lot of low oxygen because of this dive response. Interestingly enough, so we splash our water on our face, it's really cold because us humans have this reflex in us because we are also mammals our system will respond, it'll, it'll, it'll do a bit of a constriction and it's priming this part of our dorsal vagus, this, this, this dorsal vagus that is sort of tippy toeing on that freeze area. And the system gets a hit of blood to the, the organs, it shifts the physiology and it can feel good, right? But the thing is, is we need to, again, in my opinion, we need to learn how to regulate and work with this parasympathetic nervous system in conjunction with our sympathetic nervous system so that we don't need to always splash our face with water to shift ourselves out of some form of parasympathetic tone that isn't good for us. All right, so dorsal, the dorsal portion of the parasympathetic is important. We need it. We need it so that when we are under threat, we can go there and preserve and protect and slow our metabolism down. We also have this other portion of the, of the dorsal that is the rest digest that repairs our body. Okay, I know the questions are, how does this relate to autoimmune? How does this relate to chronic pain, et cetera, et cetera, I will get there. So if you think about the human system, us, we wanna live most of our time in that ventral social engagement, being connected way where we're regulated, enjoying life, orienting to the world with pleasure, not defense and shock and threat and hypervigilance, because that kicks us into freeze over time. We want this goodness, this ventral. We also want to live a lot of our lives in the portion of that dorsal that is rest digest. This is where it gets a little complex, right? Because it's not just one thing, because we're very complex. Now, if we think of the human being growing up, again, I'll use that example of the infant. Let's just say, again, infant was raised with not a lot of good of social engagement. Mom didn't know how to socially engage. Maybe her voice was very tense and very harsh and there was, you know, the, there was no plumpness in the face and it was just stern and stoic and strict. You know, I'm thinking about some of those images that I saw, see from my, my, my ancestors. They're standing there, you know, times are tough. There's no smiles on the faces. It is very bleak and looks very miserable, right? Um, and so it's just this very stoic that is not going to help a little human 
find that ventral vagal and it's going to make it such that at, over time, if that little one realizes I have no one to connect to, no one's attuning to me, no one's listening to me, I'm crying, I'm fussing, and no one is coming to my skin and touching me with ease and rocking me and, and cooing. And eventually that little one flips into the dorsal shutdown response, the freeze response. It realizes no one's coming to save me and to help me. And so that little one becomes good, becomes a good baby. That little one becomes good at being quiet, good at not fussing, good at not listening to their own physiology. And it amazes me how crazy adaptable humans are because many kiddos, many infants have this situation and they survive, but that survival comes at a cost because go into childhood with that adolescence, adulthood, we then start to break down. The system with time cannot regenerate and recoup. This is where we then get the chronic illnesses, the gut problems, the autoimmunity, the hormonal imbalances, all the things that so many humans struggle with, right? We could call it the human condition, et cetera, et cetera. So youth will keep us going to a certain point, but then the system, it cannot keep regenerating when it is firing in this very high level of fight, flight, and high shutdown. Okay. So this will answer the question, does this cause problems with the gut? Does this cause autoimmune? This is how this happens. And that connects with the ACE study that has shown when there's a lot of adversity when we're young, over time, if we are not working with the body and working at this level, the system will get sick. And this also can create um, psychological, mental issues later in life. I'm speaking more from a organ-based perspective today. I'm gonna keep it that way for now. Um, but this is how the system breaks down. We lack that really good self-regulation within the system and the system is kind of on fight, flight, freeze agenda. It's literally flying at an altitude, <laughs> to use an example, where it is highly stressed, but, but still going. Okay, I'm gonna pause, I'm gonna look at the questions, I'm gonna look at my notes to make sure there's nothing else that I wanted to go towards. Ah, there's one more thing. So are coping mechanisms a fight, flight, freeze response? If so, do we have to complete those responses in order to get out of a coping mechanism? How do we release these stress hormones? So fight, flight, freeze, first of all, we need it, right? We need to have it when there is a real threat. What happens, unfortunately, is we get into those fight, flight, freeze. So think of that infant who then becomes a child, adolescent, adult, et cetera, if she is going into that fight, flight, freeze to cope with the unsafety in the environment, if there is never a moment where, where they think, they stop, they go, something's not right here. And if you guys are here listening, then you are in that boat. You're actually using your higher brain awareness to go, something's not right here. And yes, I was in an unsafe environment and oh my goodness, holy cow, fight, flight, freeze was how I was living forever, right? Um, we then go, okay, I have to work with this. So the completion of those responses is very tricky um, because sometimes it isn't completing a fight reaction or a flea reaction. It can be sometimes the, the level of unsafety is at the organ level. It's at the gut level, it's at the brain stem level, at the kidney adrenal level, at the immune system level. And so part of the work that I have studied, somatic experiencing the work of Peter Levine, he was kind of known for completing the fight, flight, freeze responses, getting out of that stuck shock trauma, which might look like a running response. He talks about that in his book where he works with this woman who's very unwell and she remembers a tonsillectomy when she was five years old where she was held down, tried to escape and couldn't. Um, and so as an adult, they completed that desire to run 
that she had in her body, you know, decades later from when she was five. So sometimes we do need to complete and release a fight response, a flea response. And from my experience, those who are living with more chronic illness type situations, there is a deeper dysregulation with the, within the autonomic nervous system that basically is begging for safety. It's begging for that feeling that I am okay, that I have what we would call a safe haven, that there is um, a base, a secure base where I can land and not be constantly hypervigilant or constantly shut down in this immobility response where I am with tons of fear in my body, right? And so it depends on the type of traumas to this question that this person had. Um, and to get out of these fight, flight, freeze reactions, again, this is what I do in my program. So how do we get out of that? We have to work with the physiology. We have to understand the physiology. We have to understand how to listen to the stress chemistry. So it's not so simple to say, let's just get rid of the stress hormones. We have to understand and become masters of feeling the internal and directing our attention to help it come down. The work, the book that I did that reading from, Steve Terrell and Kathy Kane's book, their work is focused on this early, early developmental, um, early trauma level. When you are one month old or two months old or one year old or two, year, two, year, two years old, Again, there can be shock traumas, but when you're that young, the system cognitively isn't imprinting it as I have to run out of here. The system just knows danger, danger, danger. The world is a safe, is an unsafe place. I'm going to die. I better shut down and protect. And so if that was the case, which is typically the case, and I'm being very general here, but it's typically the case for those that have chronic illnesses, autoimmune, et cetera, et cetera. It isn't enough to just run on the spot and punch something out to get the system regulated. There needs to be this re-nurturing, maybe nurturing for the first time of the body, of the nervous system, slowly the same way that baby that is born would have had an apprenticeship with the mother to help her, him find their self-regulation. And so as adults, we can start to play with that with ourselves because the system, we have the capacity to shift and change due to neuroplasticity, right? We can change and shift and grow these things. And that's what I have seen is that when you have an adult that decides to do this work, wants to do this work, sets the attention to do this work, it can take about two to three years for the regulation to come back. And that might seem like a really long time because we live in this world of quick fixes, right? And I want it now, now, now. But if you think about the time it would have taken you when you were young to gain that good myelination in your nervous system, to learn self-regulation, to learn how to have strong, healthy aggression and boundaries and be in the world and have good facial expression and know how to have different sounds come out of your mouth and out of your voice box, it, that takes time. And so often, you know, there is this sort of sweet spot where, so, you know, sometimes it takes a few years or a solid chunk of time to retune and rewire and bring back these parts of our vagus nerve, the, the ventral that socially engages and that low tone dorsal that brings back the immune system the digestion, the cell repair, the regeneration, et cetera. Okay, I'm gonna go to the questions here. Leslie asks, how do you explain good myelination being overridden by a mentally ill parent of nine, 11, of a nine to 11 year old who the experience is a still face adult? So I think I get that question. Um, so yes, if we have a, um, an adult, a caregiver, and there was an experiment actually, uh, Crystal, you could pop it up. If you Google still face experiment, 
it was quite a while ago. I don't think ethically we could do this anymore, but this doctor had um, mothers come in who were healthy with their kiddos and they were playing, they would, they would fill them, film them being played with like sitting across from each other, cooing and hello and all those sorts of things. And then the mother's role after a few minutes was to then just stare with no, nothing, just dead face. The infant starts to fuss. It starts to reach. It starts to look. You see the distress, the redness in its face. It becomes hypervigilant. It's like, what is happening? Mother was just there and now she's stone cold, right? And then of course, when that happens, they break it and then she goes and soothes and comforts and the baby um, comes down. Now, you know, something like that, where there was already good regulation and attunement with the mother and the child, one little event like that isn't going to ruin that child for life, right? It's just an experiment. It's quick. It's over. They film it for the sake of, of the research. It's done. But imagine that over years. Imagine that exactly like you're saying. Um, so um, that is how that still face, that no expression translates the baby is confused. The little mammal is confused. They are DN their DNA, our, our system is wired for that connection. And then when we don't see it, it puts us into distress. It puts us into a stress response pattern. The sympathetic spikes because something's not right. When nothing then is helped, we go into that shutdown. When we are in that shutdown, that high tone dorsal, it, it, co-ops, it stops the rest digest, the cell repair, right? So when we're in a high tone dorsal state, we cannot rest and digest. This is why you will hear um, people say, um, I am so tired all the time. Um, I sleep so much, but I wake up exhausted and I'm not repairing general cuts and stuff like that right? This is where the irritable bowel comes. The bowel is not repairing at night. It's not stitching back up. And so over time, the system wears out because we are living in that high dorsal state. And we're not getting the rest digest. So we want to flip the switch, if you will. We want to, and it's not something where you just flip the switch. So I, I say that kind of with a grain of salt. We want to slowly start to overturn being more engaged with, with ourselves, with this low tone dorsal of the parasympathetic. Okay. Ah, fainting. So I'm going to cover that. So there is a, there is a, um, so remember I was saying the dorsal branch of the parasympathetic part of it is that high tone dorsal that puts us into shutdown into freeze. It lowers metabolism. The blood pressure goes low. The heart rate goes low. All the blood goes to the organs et cetera, et cetera. So one of the classic examples is people sometimes will faint when they see something intense, right? Um, they see the sight of blood and instantly they're out, they're, on, they're literally on the floor or they're, they're seeing something or they're hearing something and it's too much. The system goes into sympathetic. So it starts to ramp up. Something's not right. Something's not right. If the person isn't catching that, and if their regulation is off, if they're living, let's say, in more dysregulation, uh, dysregulated nervous system, they will realize unconsciously, this isn't something you're thinking, by the way, it's automatic. That's what's called autonomic nervous system. The system goes, no one is bringing this sympathetic response down. No one's catching this, right? The, the person isn't catching this, um, you know, and we are going into high alert and this is intense on the body and the system is going to throw on this vagus break. It's going to be like, no, nope, we're not doing this anymore. We're going to shut you down. We're going to go super high tone dorsal, lower the blood pressure, lower the, um, the oxygen, lower the heart rate. For some people that just might them make them feel a little woozy. They don't have to sit down. I got to right? Or for some, it happens so quick that they pass out. So that explains the fainting response. Um, we get stressed. 
we don't realize it's happening and it's like a rocket ship going into space. We can't get it. Now, of course, as we learn how to track our sympathetic arousal, as we start to track, oh, I'm getting a little fluttery. I'm getting a little hot. I'm starting to lose orientation to the space around me. Something must be happening. It's being able to catch and notice those things and go, okay, something's not right here. I better calm or maybe I need to move. Maybe I need to drink some water. Maybe I do need to splash that water on my face or maybe I need to resource to something. One of the key um, features of working with the nervous system when I do with my students is teaching orienting. So bringing back what we would call a exploratory orienting. You could even do it right now as I'm talking. Can you look slowly at the world around you, books on your table, furniture, walls, curtains, windows, clouds, the rain falling from the sky, to slowly start to see things around in a curiosity-driven way. That movement, the eyes, the movement of the head, that can kick up and turn on our self-regulation capacities. Sometimes it depends on where we are, and this is why this is quite complex. For others, exploratory orienting can actually put them into more sympathetic because maybe their childhood was riddled with a lot of stress and trauma and the environment was dangerous. So for them, it might be more appropriate to just feel the body and connect more internally, but still be aware and in the here and now as opposed to disconnection and dissociating from the intensity. Um, so something like fainting, something like being overly aroused, overstimulated, again, this is the autonomic nervous system. It's going into fight, flight. If it can't come down, it might go into shutdown, and then it might put us into that kind of fainting situation. Now, of course, if we all fainted every time we got stressed, we wouldn't be very productive. So this is why a lot of human beings are living often in kind of a functionally frozen state. I did another video about this a while ago. We can pop it up in the chat, but we can go along and be pretty good with life, but we actually have a bit of a freeze response there that's kind of half on. It's on, but it's on like, it's like it's second gear rather than fifth gear. And while that can get us through life for quite a while, this is where we see the deterioration. This is where we might see in our 40s and 50s, the autoimmune things start to pop up, the cancer start to pop up, the heart problems start to pop up, the hormonal problems start to pop up. Our system actually has been just regulated enough, but not fully in regulation. And so the system is wearing down more than it is recouping and rejuver rejuvenating as we age. I say that with quotes, right? And so functional freeze is very common in Western society. We're functional, we're living, but we're also a little bit trapped in our conditioned responses. We're not listening to our physiology and expressing our needs, our boundaries, our emotions, our angers, et cetera. And when we don't express these emotions, when we don't get these things out, that's what then flips us into these protective modes of the parasympathetic, of this high tone dorsal of the parasympathetic or that fight flight of the sympathetic. So know that they're always kind of working together in a way to keep us safe. Okay, I'm gonna head back to the chat here. Hmm, the gray hair question. It's a tough one, isn't it? You know, I don't know the, the research on that, but yeah, there are, there's some pretty strong uh, stories. I know of some friends who've been in some very bad accidents who are young and within a matter of a year, their whole head turns gray. Um, and that is definitely a sign of stress. And then there's kind of a genetic thing where it just kind of happens. Um, but I'm always open to the possibility that we can reverse that when we get really, really healthy and well. Who knows, right? Um, I know my gray started to come in when there was a bit more stress in my life uh, about five years ago, um, and I haven't been able to reverse it yet. So we'll see. I'll keep you. I'll keep you posted. 
Yeah, and someone said the fourth F, fawn. So that's a socialized response. It reinforces safety. It also is maladaptive in some ways. So people will go into this fawn response. There's many ways, and I'm, I don't want to get fully into it today. Um, I have done another video on it. But it's us being mature enough to know I better change myself to fit into this family system, into this school system, into this world system, right? And so interestingly enough, we will see sometimes in families who have lots of chronic illness, um, getting a chronic illness can be actually a fawn response. It's a physiological fawn response to fit in, right? Because everyone is unwell and this isn't something we consciously think about, but the system goes, well, if I'm gonna stay in the system, I can't have vigor and health because none of the family members around me have it. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna be unwell as well. And we kind of put ourselves into a bit of a biological depression, so to speak, staying small, staying meat, staying quiet, not expressing our healthy aggression, which is super important for human health. Um, so fawn is an interesting one. It's definitely more advanced, um, much more advanced. Someone said, yeah, functional frozen state, state, state resonates. Yeah, I mean, when I got into this work in 2008, I had no clue, you guys, how damn functionally frozen I was. I was functional, but I was frozen. But I also could teach. So here's what's so tricky. I had full social engagement capabilities, um, but there was this part of my physiology that was trapping survival stress that I had had probably since birth and also now that I know in utero. And so we have no clue sometimes what it is that we are harboring within our system. And I'm here to say it doesn't have to be terrifying. It's just this knowledge. How can you know as an adult, this is what I want to work on. And it's going to be a bumpy ride because you're bringing up these physiological responses that are very, very terrifying, right? We go into shutdown because we're terrified. We don't go into shutdown because we're having a good time, right? And so when we're working to come out of freeze, know that we might feel some intensity. And the one thing I didn't um, mention, so that shutdown immobility response, in some cases, we need to shut down. And one of the key um, examples that Poor just gives, and uh, my teachers, Kathy and Steve give, and interestingly enough, Porge's wife is um, a researcher with the hormone oxytocin. I mean, they're just a science couple extraordinaire. And so her name is Sue Carter, and she has really been the one who has studied oxytocin. And that is released, released when we are in good connection and in communication and love and good empathy with others, especially with our little ones. And so when a baby is nursing from its mom, the mother has to go into an immobility response, right? She has to become still enough so that the little one can suckle. That is immobility without fear, without fear, right? But interestingly enough, we also have immobility with fear. So if someone goes into a shock state, has to immobilize, I think about the person that Peter talks about in his book, who was under um, having a tonsillectomy, she was immobilized, she then had to go into an immobility state, and she was terrified. That level of physiological strain packs a big punch. It's high energy and it's terrifying. So one of the things that sometimes stops people sometimes when they do this work is as they start to feel these, these, these froze, these freeze breaks, these freeze suppressions, they start to come off, they will start to feel the fear and the terror and even some of the images maybe and the sensations, the somatic experiences, right? That's why Peter called it somatic experiencing they're feeling the somatic experiences that were trapped. And so what often happens is this comes up and if we don't have the foundation on board and the knowledge and the practice and the base level um, ground school to know what to do with it, 
we then can re-traumatize ourselves. And this is why, my friends, we see this. People don't do enough baseline work. They dive into working on a piece of trauma and their whole system goes kapow, right? I've had quite a few emails and messages from people who have gone into things like ayahuasca retreats, medicine, plant medicine, because that's the thing to do now. And they've had no groundwork. They don't know how to track their physiology. They don't know how to stay tethered to the here and now. They do these potent medicines and their system just gets ripped apart, right? I'm not opposed to them, but if we go into those without the groundwork, we have to be willing and ready for what's gonna come up. And sometimes it causes a crack in the system and that's where psychosis can occur. That's where a severe autoimmune flare can occur, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I kind of went off on a little bit of a tangent there, but I wanted to mention just this importance of understanding that A, this polyvagal theory, it's always working in us, right? This isn't something that just got developed in the world and now it's there. It was always in us from the beginning, right? It was within the mammals that have been here for longer than us, apparently. Um, it's just that we're understanding through this research how it works. And I would say from what I've seen, the work that I've studied through Peter Levine, somatic experiencing, the work that I've uh, learned through Kathy Kane and Steve Terrell and their somatic practice work, working with the organ systems, along with um, just really solid learning and foundation building. This is the stuff that we wanna work with so that we can slowly start to rejuvenate and recalibrate and regulate these branches of our autonomic nervous system. It's not just the vagus system, it's also the sympathetic system. And it's also how those systems react to and respond to our organ systems. And remember at the very beginning, if you've been here from the beginning, how we interact, how we see people. I mean, right now, it's a, you know, there's a reason why so many people are struggling with mental illness, the suicide rates, I hate to be a downer, are up so much, especially in, in kiddos and in teenagers. They need that social connection. They need to see faces. They need touch. They need they need to be joyous and orienting and moving with others, right? Someone who has really strong regulation, they can get by. But if you were brought up without that good regulation and you don't know how to internally resources on your, resource on your own, um, this lack of facial connection is very, very, very damaging. Um, so I just want to pop that in there because I've been talking about the importance of children seeing face so important. Babies need to see the face of their mothers all the time. I'm terrified at what might be occurring with the kiddos who aren't seeing their mother's faces right now. Um, we don't know what's going to happen with that. Um, okay. I covered immobilization without fear. I covered the dorsal. I covered the ventral. Um, and so, you know, this is why it you know, feels good to sing for people that like to sing, people like to hum, people like to drink and eat. It stimulates the vagus nerve. It stimulates with the talking and the speaking, this upper part, the ventral, the social engagement. That's why we, you know, humor is so important. Um, watching a show that, that makes us laugh hearing music and it doesn't have to be um, classical. It can be like heavy bass. It can be rap, just whatever it is that gets that beat through the ear, that vagus nerve, it, 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 it connects to these hearing places in our, our voice box, right? So this is why these things can help us. Um, the drum, these deep baritone sounds, they, they go into the belly, right? If you've ever been in a drum circle or if you've been to say the symphony or the orchestra or you just listen with some really good speakers, some really deep bass, you feel it through your body. That's the vagus nerve stimulating, sparking up. Um, and the thing is, however, is that we need to, from my experience, we need to do more than just listen to music and hum and sing and splash water on our faces and eat good food. We, if we know that we have had this early upbringing that wasn't safe, that wasn't 
of good myelination, we need to do a little more um, deeper work. So um, uh, I'm just gonna go to the comments here and then I will we will pop off for today. Um, if you haven't uh, checked out, I've got a drop-in class this Saturday. We do these once a month. We've been doing them for over almost two years now. Um, and they're always on Saturdays at 12 p.m. Pacific. It's a hour long class, $19. You get the recording afterwards. We show up together um, and we play. And this weekend I'm gonna be covering orienting as a resource. So remember I was mentioning the need for us to orient and visually engage with the world. I'm gonna be bringing in more of our senses. So we have our smell, our sight, our kinesthetic perception. So it'll be a gentle lesson, um, and we're just going to layer and play with some of our um, peripheral, peripheral um, environmental uh, senses, um, orienting responses, and using that as a way to self-regulate and really connect with the physiology. How do you dis discover that you are dysregulated in utero? You know, I wish that were a quick answer. Of course, you know. If you have parents that st are still alive, that still might not help because they might not have any clue. Um, uh, and by the way, I really encourage us to not confront our caregivers if you know they harmed you. It's not very um, productive unless they are also doing the work. I did a video on that a little while ago. Just want to put that plug in for that video because I don't want people to be more traumatized thinking they have to tell their parents, for example, how much they screwed them up. It just isn't worth it. It's not necessary. That's kind of putting us back into victim mode, victim identification. We can, we can process the grief of the fact that we didn't have good care. Um, we can process the hurt, the anger, the sadness, maybe the disgust of what occurred to us. Um, very important to do that but sometimes that's best done solo or with a therapist or a practitioner, or if you have a partner that can support you, um, especially when those caregivers are still stuck in their own shutdown and freeze response, because they will just get defensive or they'll just shut down more. Okay, next question, which leads perfectly into what I just said. If we are dysregulated and also with a dysregulated partner, is there any hope that the person doing the work can regulate the resistance partner long-term goal after focusing on self? So I'll be really blunt. If the partner is has no interest, like none, there's not even like a speck of light coming through, I don't want to say that things are impossible, but it will be very difficult to do your own healing and help them if they don't have the desire you know you you can't even lead that horse to water right um and so i experienced that in my 20s i was with someone lovely person you know wasn't abusive by any means but just no in no interest in furthering in this level and i had to make a decision and so i shifted that um, but yeah, it's very hard when the, when the partner is resistant, if they're open to understanding that maybe their resistance is because of their old trauma, then that's great. But two people who are dysregulated can have a great time working with their healing and helping each other and supporting each other, but they have to be both looking in the same direction. It's like parents who are looking in opposite direction. That's the other thing I didn't mention that can cause a little one to not gain good self-regulation. Maybe the mother is doing all the right things, um, but let's say her relationship with her partner is terrible. That will still influence the little one, right? There'll still be something that's kind of off. Oh, great, that's right, yes. If you have done the Healing Trauma video series, there is a 15 minute neurosensory exercise there. So definitely check that out. Um, it's only 15 minutes long. Give it a try. Um, it's something that lives on our site all the time, but we really mention it within that healing trauma session training. So go for that, do that. Is the vagus nerve the embodied extension of the silver cord? I have no idea. I'm not sure what you mean by that. Um, I'm assuming that's something more esoteric and more um, universal, maybe. Um, if so, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I don't know everything. Um, 
Okay, great, Cindy. Thank you for your comment. You're welcome. <laughs> Someone says, I don't know how my neighbors will respond to my loud bass. Earphones? Don't blow out your eardrums, though. Um, during the day, maybe. Someone asks, um, can you give me some tips for working with mania, hypomania, and grandiosity? Honestly, go to the basics, you know? So in our programs, we're not saying this is for this person, this is for that person. We're working at just regulating the whole system in general. And so part of um, our system, like things like mania, bipolar, there's these swings from one state to another. And then of course, the early traumas that created that. I have a very strong belief and many of my mentors do. Most of the things that we deal with as human beings are not due to the genetics express the genetics alone. It's due to our genetics expressing as a result of the environment we are in. This is something that Gabor Mate talks about a lot. Porges obviously does, Peter Levine, um, all of the big thinkers within this world of trauma, the new traumatology, we really have seen that um, just because you have a genetic imprint for something doesn't mean that you're going to have that problem. The, the genetics get expressed when we are under certain stresses that don't go away. I'm being very simple here. This is the field of epigenetics. Yeah, someone just said, Emma just said, um, I never thought of it like that. My great grandmother, grandma and mom have all seemed to suffer from anxiety. Yeah, well, remember when I mentioned the baby, if that baby, if your mother who has your grandmother as a mom is terrified, you know, great depression, wars, whatever, and she isn't able to sink into the yumminess of her own body, the goodness of her own body, the touch that she has is going to be scared. It's going to be a frantic um, this worry of not having enough food, not knowing when our partners are going to come back from war, being bombed, you know, in the middle of the blitz, all these things that so many of our ancestors grew through and grew up in. Um, it's a real thing. And most of those people didn't do the work to heal. They then had babies, baby boom, and then they had us. Right. And so we are very, and of course, we're all different ages here, but we're all at a very unique time. And this might be how I end today's call. We're all in a very unique time right now. We are aware now of these transitions and how this stuff can travel, travel through. It isn't just magic, right? Like it happens because there is that interaction with the children. Um, in the way that they know and it gets passed on, not just magically, it's because of how you interact, right? This is why some family members will have facial expressions that are exactly the same. It's because of um, they just mimicked and copied and followed the path of the family, right? Whereas when you have family systems where um, the parents really allowed the kiddos to express and be themselves, um, and those kids then grew up to develop themselves and break free from their traumas. They look not, they might resemble, but they don't have the same patterns. They don't have the same mannerisms. I would say that that's something that I've noticed in myself um, with my parental system. I don't have the same mannerisms as my parents, and it's because of that work that I've done. I've shifted. There's some essences that are there, but I am not them. But when we don't break the pattern, when we just keep going, we are basically creating the same thing over and over again. All right. So going to um, pause and stop for today. Thank you for being here, you guys. I didn't realize we're already an hour and a half. How did that happen? Um, I am doing, like I said, drop in class on Saturday. This will obviously be recorded on YouTube. I have tons of other videos that you can watch here, long form question and answer. We did a wonderful one on Tuesday, the 16th this week. Lots of questions. I did one the week before on the 9th of February. Um, and we will be opening up Smart Body, Smart Mind registration on Monday for the 2021 round. Um, and just know that this program is not it doesn't end at 12 weeks. It's a 12 week program, but it's something that you have for life. It's something that you work with constantly, continually. We have alumni that have been with us since the beginning back in 2000. 
and 16, I think. Um, so it's something that keeps growing. This is the 10th time we've run this course. It gets into the practical work that needs to occur to work at this polyvagal autonomic nervous system, somatic, visceral, social engagement, environmental engagement level. We cover all of it. It isn't just breathing techniques and, and humming and these sorts of things. We do do that and we add in everything else. Um, so it's very biological, but it's also very energetic in that we are moving through all the systems in the physical body and also how the physical body connects to the environment and to other people. It's theory, it's practical, there's group support. We do Q and A questions like this on Zoom. You get to meet your peers. It's a really wonderful way to kind of go to ner nervous system university, if you will, and, and learn how to become your own medicine, which is all, all about what I love. So thank you everybody for being here. I'm gonna pause this end this for the day. We will be back with another live stream special topic in March, um, but hopefully we see, we see you before then. I think that's everything. Um, thank you for all your thank yous. You are welcome. We'll talk to you next time.